everyone. Thank you for being patient with us this morning. We were facing some technical difficulties here on our end. I'm going to go ahead and get started since we are a couple minutes behind. Um, and then we can just kind of let people in as we're going along. Um, so my name is Taryn Basson. You might be familiar with me at this point. I'm the Marketing Communications Coordinator here at the Northern Ontario Angels. We will begin this workshop by acknowledging that we are meeting virtually on Indigenous lands that has been inhibited by Indigenous people. We acknowledge all of the treaties and traditional territories on which all of you gather today. So thank you so much for joining us this morning for our webinar on intellectual property awareness in education um, and service offering with the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, otherwise known as CEPO. Uh, the Investor Ready Program is an entrepreneurial training program designed to equip participants with the skills, knowledge, and tools required to create compelling business propositions and attract potential investors. So this program is a joint effort between Link North and the Northern Ontario Angels. So brief introduction, I'm going to introduce uh, Ian Lane, Executive Director of the Northern Ontario Angels. Thanks, Taryn. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us this morning. Uh, I see some familiar faces from some of these other workshops and some some new faces as well. So thanks for finding the time to, to hop on and learn on this important topic for uh, um, IP protection for growing your business. So as Taryn mentioned, I'm Ian Lane, the Executive Director of Northern Ontario Angels. We are um, a very active angel network organization uh, based in the north. Uh, I'm in Sudbury with our co great colleague, Kimberly Wahama Deshane, and then our other great colleague, uh, Taryn Basson, is in Timmins, and she works uh, closely with uh, with our, our good friends, Al and, and, uh, and Ross at Link North. And so um, connecting with partners in the ecosystem to, to help our, our mutual clients become investor ready and learn the essentials of, of growing their business is uh, it's a fun part of the job and really appreciate that uh, everyone is here today to um, uh, share their time with us. So looking forward to the topic. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Uh, now introducing Al Paquette, business advisor at Link North. Uh, thanks, Taryn, and uh, welcome everyone. This is our third workshop series for our Investor Ready program. So just a quick little tidbit on Link North. So we provide business advisory services, funding and deliver programming like Investor Ready to support our entrepreneurs and our business clients with launching, scaling and growing their business operation. So when we first meet with our client, our goal is to gain an understanding of the business, product or technology you want to develop, your needs and then work with you to create a roadmap that aligns with your vision as you as you help as we as you reach your goals. Sorry. So I do want to mention as a participant in our investor ready program, you can access Link North Link North's free business advisory services to assist you with developing your business model canvas or as you go through this program to help you out with other items. So I'll provide some contact info and information on how to become a Link North client in the chat box. And I'd also uh, uh, like to thank everybody for for joining us. This is our last uh, our last uh, whatever program, I guess. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Al. Uh, just a very quick reminder before we begin: we do have our close event next week. Um, it's on November twenty third starting at 6 p.m. at Full Beard Brewing here in Timmins. Um, and we're gonna be celebrating the end of the program. So we'll be putting a, a link in the chat to register and it is free registration. So please make sure you sign up. And we will also be uh, having live music from Paul Sebald uh, and a traditional Lebanese cuisine with modern twist from the Fusion Grill. So now introducing our expert, Elizabeth Collinson. Um, Elizabeth is the Acting Intellectual Property Advisor at the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. Um, she's worked with CEPO for more than 20 years in a variety of roles, including trademark examiner and business development officer. She has a passion for helping entrepreneurs understand the importance and value of intellectual property and believes strongly in providing service excellence to clients. Elizabeth is also an inactive trademark agent listed on uh, the Canadian Patent Agent and Trademark Agent um, Registrar. Um, so thank you so much, Elizabeth, for joining us today. And if you have not already done so, please mute your audio to avoid interference. Um, this presentation is being recorded and will be available after the call. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And then, Elizabeth, you can go ahead and share yours. Yeah.
So I trust you guys see my screen now. Yes, perfect. Okay. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting SIPO to be a part of your session today because it's important to us to uh, let folks know that SIPO is available to answer some of their very early questions. Uh, we're impartial. We have lots of tools and information available. And we just kind of hope that that journey can start in a positive way where they've got support to know that uh, there are no uh, you know, silly first questions. And then uh, this starts actually a journey of learning about IP, which then sets them up really well to have a decent conversation with an expert as they get closer and closer to, you know, rolling out their business adventure. So uh, my presentation today is really around that model and what do we offer from SIPO to help those very early entrepreneurs so that they think about intellectual property from the beginning uh, so that we can hopefully, you know, skip over all those errors of having to go back and do things over. So um, I think with that, I'll just get started. Uh, so um, let me see, I wanna go to my next screen. There we go. Uh, so basically there's four things that the Canadian Intellectual Property Office does. And of course we operate under Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, but we are a separate operating uh, agency, which means we don't take tax dollars. So we're very, very impartial. Um, and what we basically do is four things. We administer the acts and regulations for most IP in Canada. So that's the registering of trademarks, the granting of patents and industrial designs, et cetera. So that all comes through our office. And uh, we have about a thousand people that work at SIPO. Most of them are examiners and they're examining those applications in all the different types of IP. Um, except for copyright, we do not examine copyright applications. Uh, the second thing that we do is we're around the table at that international level, not just us, but us with all the other uh, strong IP partners that we have in Canada, so that the interests of Canadians can be around that negotiation table for treaties and accords and whatever along those lines. Uh, and the third thing that we do at SIPO is we have this IP awareness and education program, which is us just simply trying to educate people on intellectual property so they can make better business decisions. Whatever that decision is doesn't really matter, but it's made on an educated basis. And then the last thing that we have is all of our databases. So everybody who ever filed for a trademark or a patent or a copyright or whatever, these are all included in our databases free for the public to use. And so it's just full of business intelligence. And then there's links as well to all the other databases that do exist in different um, intellectual property offices in, around the world. So that's just a very, very valuable resource all at no charge. So, um, and then I was gonna just briefly talk about the types of IP, cause I know you have a presenter later today is going to go into detail on that but we do have presentations as well um, and different resources and tools that do go into those that if you wanted to, to go ahead and listen to on your own, you're more than welcome to, and I'll show you where those are. Um, but because you have an expert in the room today, I won't go into the details on any uh, of the much details. So just enough to tell you that these are different types of intellectual property and the overall goal is for you to learn about them and then pick and choose how you're going to use that to help you reach your business objectives. So one, you need to have your objectives in order. And then two, intellectual property is just another tool to help you really achieve those goals. So if your goal is to increase market share or increase revenue, how can you use IP to help you do that? So another very valuable business tool. So basically your trademark is all about branding and uh, a brand can be anything from uh, anything that's distinctive and, and distinguishes your product or service from another product or service. Uh, and, it, and a trademark kind of links you to the ownership of that thing. So as an example, um, I was at a university this week 
And I asked the professor if he would smell something. And I made sure he didn't have any allergies. And uh, and after he smelt it, he said, oh, that's Play-Doh. So because it was so distinctive and he knew the smell, that could be a trademark. So that's just how broad it can be. Logos, words, designs, combinations of those, scents, smells, all kinds of things can brand a product. Um, under trademarks, there's other things that are very valuable, like certification marks or uh, geographic indications. And these are just big words that you can learn about later. But um, it's just there's a lot that happens under branding. So uh, you need to learn about the different ways that you can trademark a product and pick uh, if or which ones work for you to um, to increase or to, to better your chances to meet those business objectives. In terms of the patent, this is more your technology or your improvement to an existing technology. And um, these are much more complicated to uh, figure out on your own as an entrepreneur who's busy trying to build a business. And so I would uh, very much encourage someone to uh, expect to hire an expert in the end to really explain to you or help you understand what the chances are of you getting a patent and being successful in actually uh, finding something very particular that you're going to, to fence in. And it's in the claims that they'll write. Um, and so it really does take an expert in the field plus an expert in writing out patent claims. So this is not something the average entrepreneur could successfully do on their own, I'd say many, many, many times over. Um, and then most of actually our patent applications are for improvements to existing patents, but something that's valuable, like in the uh, mention I made of the different databases, you could go into the patent database and start seeing what other people categorize their product as. You can check uh, if it's um, in good standing with our office, if the maintenance fees are being paid, all kinds of things that might be important if you were going to go into partnership or maybe uh, purchase somebody else's patent. And copyrights is very much cultural, literary, artistic. Um, the Copyright Act is ginormous and uh, kind of goes on and on and on. But one uh, cool thing is that you can have a copyright automatically. So you can just put a C in a circle with the year and your name. And if you believe that that's your original rendition of something, that that's totally okay. The problem is, is that somebody else can do the same thing. So that's why it's sometimes not enough. Same with trademarks. You don't have to register a trademark. It's just that there's advantages if you do in terms of licensing and ownership. Um, and then industrial designs is all about the shape of something. So you can say like the eye candy. Industrial designs do not protect functionality. That's the difference between the the shape and the design and the appeal of a product. Uh, so you could have um, a certain beverage in a bottle that's shaped a very distinctive bottle that we all would recognize, let's say, um, but it doesn't dictate functionality. So that makes it a good industrial design. And um, something else I should have mentioned is the, the patents. There is criteria for the patents. And one that's very important is it has to be novel. So if this is not something novel, then your chances of getting a patent are, are not very good. So that's just the importance of really learning about intellectual property. There's so many valuable pieces of information that you need to kind of be exposed to in order to then mix it all up and come out with you know, a strategy. And, and that's the overall goal. And then there's different types of intellectual property that we haven't even talked about that are very important. Um, such as a, a trade secret, your domain names, all kinds of things that are going to have an effect on your trademark, your patent, your copyright, and your industrial design. So that's just like a really once quick over. Uh, my real goal here is to show you what SIPO can offer in terms of those very first end services and why would it be important to think about your intellectual property? Well, the answer is you want to one, avoid costly mistakes. You wanna make sure you're not infringing on somebody else because what that's gonna do is gonna set you back. 
you're going to have to start over and go backwards instead of going forwards, which is never fun. Um, also, having intellectual property definitely gives you an edge over the competition. It allows you to show a level of seriousness. It can actually demonstrate in many cases that you have an innovation, which is often a requirement for a grant um, or funding for business. They'll ask you to fill out applications and that, you know, to identify what is your innovation. Uh, it can help you reach business goals. It looks attractive to investors, uh, ups the value of a person's um, business. And of course, you can acquire many good customers who can then be kind of a trusted test base for your product. So lots of important things to think about intellectual property. And this is just a really cursory review right off the top. So um, in our awareness and education program, um, whoops, I think I went to the, yeah, that's the slide. We have basically five areas that I'll cover today. It's discussing the strategic value of intellectual property, how to identify the relevant types, uh, explaining the ways to protect IP, how to manage IP, and then uh, sharing with you some information on finding those tools yourself on our website. And if we have time, I'm happy to go to the website just demonstrating where you click and where you find things. So um, basically we've got the categories as being educational services, then we have some digital learning products, in-person sessions that we carry out, and then online. So under the first in showing what intellectual property is, what you're seeing on the screen is an industrial design fact sheet. And we call those just something CEPRO has to offer. We call those like a one pager and it gives you all the most important elements of the industrial design. And so if you were to read through those fact sheets, you'd gain a lot of information just doing that step which is something I would encourage you to do. And it'll make you have questions. And then when you go searching for the answers of those questions, you learn more things. So it's kind of a, a once overview, a quick glance at uh, you know, what would an industrial design uh, look like in your business. And then we have that same fact sheet for patents, trademarks, plant breeder rights, which are, um, uh, the names of like plants and, and botanical products. So, and we have those on our register just so we don't grant a registration for them. Uh, it's not something that our acts, we don't manage the acts and rules for that. It's more the uh, Canadian Food Inspection Agency. So those fact sheets are um, one great tool that I could point you in the direction of. Also, we have these learn the basics uh, series. And so you can just do these self-study courses whenever you might have some time. And we have one for IP overall, and then an extra one for patent, trademark, copyright, and industrial design. And lately I can say that there's many great intellectual property courses available for free. And it's rare to find one that's not good. Like they're all very good. Just, just go searching and you'll see what I mean. Also under what is the IP, we have some fairly interesting uh, podcasts uh, that I've listened to most of them myself, and I'd say they're all entertaining, uh, informative, and uh, sometimes it's just the perfect thing while you're driving or doing something else. And so you could go listen to those recorded interviews. We have some IP talks on our YouTube channel and some short videos as well. So those would be a helpful resource. In terms of uh, one thing we find often is that an entrepreneur might not realize that they have intellectual property. So that would be a real problem because if you don't realize that you have it, you don't realize that you need to maybe think about what to do with it. <laughs> so this is a, an inventory checklist, which just starts to ring through different things that actually belong to a business that you probably have and didn't realize that you did have. So, um, it just gets you thinking in the right direction. 
And of course, you can always reach out to CIPO. You can meet with an intellectual property advisor such as myself. And even our client service center are very knowledgeable at uh, the basics of intellectual property and looking at applications that you may have filed. Now, if there's an agent on file of uh, who is serving you, then they won't be able to give you any information about the file, but there's lots of other general information that is available that can be helpful. We also have these roadmaps to formal IP rights. And the point of those, it just kind of illustrates what is that process. So this one here is particular to uh, a trademark application, but we have them for all applications. We have them for oppositions, uh, and like anything that you do in our office, pretty much there's a roadmap for it. And it's just a very general kind of what you can expect to go through in terms of the filing, the examination, uh, when you file for a trademark, there's uh, other things that happen. There's examiners' reports that go back and forth between the examiners, same within patents. Uh, eventually, it might be advertised, and then uh, somebody may or may not oppose. This happens every week for trademarks on Wednesdays. And, um, you know, it just kind of guides you through that whole process as a, as a starting point to, to be able to give you some information. And then we have some step-by-step -step resources that are handy as well in terms of intellectual property rights or intellectual property theft. We also have them for writing an IP strategy. We have some uh, special topics that we have extra sheets on. So software rights in Canada is one. Uh, we have one for clean tech standards um, and hiring an intellectual property professional. Because one thing you should know is our database is public. So at a certain point, things will be made public and people do go into the database and uh, start emailing the applicants different things and trying to convince them they should do stuff. So you really need to be aware of who is reaching out to you. And if ever you have doubt, you just pick up the phone and you contact your own agent or you contact SIPO to, to validate that you've got this call and you know or this piece of mail. So I would encourage you to be suspicious for sure. Uh, neither the agent nor SIPO is going to mind if you call to validate something you've received. We have some handy guides on uh, when you might wanna think about going global. So these are just really basic uh, documents that give you an idea of what it might look like if you were trying to protect in another country, such as one of the ones listed on this slide. And then there's some uh, video series on protecting abroad and also some uh, additional step-by-step -step resources. So this is a tool that uh, was developed and it's quite handy actually on trying to build an intellectual property strategy. And it probably sounds overwhelming in the beginning, but believe it or not, if you do start um, noticing intellectual property and reading the odd thing about it, you'll soon become kind of um, attracted to it. And you'll start to actually learn more and more and you kind of get drawn in. And uh, that process just turns you into somebody who now has some knowledge and it just builds on itself. And so at one point you might want to try, try an intellectual property strategy. It's kind of like your business plan, but just about IP. It would be under your other business plan and again, it's just nothing more than uh, added tools to help you reach those business objectives. So an example might be, um, you may find that uh, in the business you're in, one IP would make more difference than another. Maybe your, your technology is not new. So then maybe you're not gonna file for a patent on the technology, but maybe you're gonna license it from someone else. Or maybe you investigate that patent or patents and you realize that they're about to expire or that the maintenance fees have not been paid or maybe they have been paid uh, and you're exploring who owns them and what's all going on in that field or industry. And so you're getting an idea, you know, what do I think about the patent on this? But you're also gonna think about branding. And sometimes branding doesn't matter. You don't need it, but other times it might. And then so you're going to say, but my branding is going to be tied to my domain name. So I better think about that. And some people will say, well, if the .ca is taken, I'll just take the other one. 
Um, uh, and that's not really a good way to think about it just because if somebody has a very similar domain name, probably means they also have a trademark. So that would be problematic for you. Um, and then you say, well, you know, this is starting to sound maybe difficult or expensive or uh, so what what can I do with maybe copyright or can I do a shape to my product that doesn't dictate functionality to help people recognize it and buy it first before they buy another one? Or if it's a liquid in a distinguished bottle, for instance. So all of this is going on. And at one point, it does start to uh, make sense to you. And you can then say, yeah, I get why I need to think about these different forms of intellectual property so that I can come up with a plan that suits my budget and that helps me achieve my objectives. And that's pretty much all this is all about. And um, along the way, you will absolutely need the expertise of those people that are around you right now. And you have a very big advantage that you're in this cohort because, uh, or in this environment because they're already looking out for your success and will not allow you to make these big errors where you end up infringing on somebody's IP or not planning ahead. So you're, you're already like 10 steps ahead of lots of uh, entrepreneurs who have really no idea uh, how important the intellectual property is. Your group knows that it's important. And that's why you've got um, IP firms or law firms that have IP people or SIPO with some expertise as well at your table uh, delivering some of these sessions for you. So that's a really good thing for you guys. Um, other places where you can expect to find help is uh, local agents near you. So uh, you'd want to make sure that somebody is an actual lawyer or they belong to uh, a proper institute or uh, are a member of the CIPADA organization um, or registered as an agent under CIPADA. So there's lots of different ways. Don't be shy to validate the people that you're going to trust because that's why these systems are in place for you. And uh, you can uh, not, not be shy at all. You're protecting your bottom dollar and, and looking for success. So these are normal, important steps to take. And so this is pretty much everything that I wanted to talk about. Uh, we did talk about what is IP, how to kind of identify it, little tools that you can use from SIPO to just get you started, let's say, on the journey of learning about IP. It is a bit contagious, so I'll warn you ahead of time. You might start noticing intellectual property everywhere now. And um, I don't know if you wanted me to uh, take you to the website and maybe show you some of these online or open some kind of an application so you can see the contents of what would be inside, but I'll open it up to uh, questions or comments from, from you guys. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to unmute yourselves and ask. You could type yeah, it out in the chat as well and we'll ask for yeah. you. Yeah, and if there's no other questions too, and if we do have some time uh, to spare as well, then Elizabeth, maybe if you'd like, you know, if you want to go over a couple of the links or something like that on the website, just to uh, provide a, maybe a quick tutorial on on how to get to these links and stuff like that. Obviously, you know, a lot of the links are all in your presentation as well, which I'm sure we'll forward to our to our attendees as well. But uh, awesome. sometimes a little user uh, a user guide is always uh, uh, a user demonstration is always better. So uh, if you don't mind, that'd be that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think maybe maybe what I'll do is I'll just end this show. And you're still seeing my screen, so I'll just go to not my email. You don't want to see my calendar. Um, I will just go to our website because that's going to be, and there it is right there. So it would be CIPO. Uh, gc.ca and you end up here that's our main page um, lots of things that uh, are on here are fairly straightforward you can see that right away you can pick and choose between the different types of intellectual property so if you already know so a lot of times I'll go into the trademarks side of things because I want to know where are we at in terms of examining applications that have recently been filed uh, which we're very behind on, by the way, and it's super um, um, inappropriate, I guess, 
But uh, what I can say on that is we are catching up. We've just hired over a hundred examiners again. And we just found, we just fought, ended up really behind uh, because of international treaties we joined, because of the pandemic, all kinds of things. Not that those are good excuses, but uh, not to worry, we're catching up. If you are going to file an application, I would suggest that you use the uh, uh, pick list of goods and services because those are guaranteed to be approved by SIPO because they already meet the NICE classification code. So it's just every trademark application that is filed is filed in association with certain goods or services. And so just use the pick list of goods and services. And that way uh, they'll, they'll already be in compliance with what we need them to be in compliance with. Um, and then if you wanted to search a trademark, you just go here. If you wanna pay the fees or something or order documents, there's different sections. There's, there's the roadmap of the application process I talked to you about. Uh, different guides. This whole trademark guide right here is an amazing product of understanding trademarks, filing a trademark application, registering a trademark outside Canada. What is expungement? But I think it'd be fun if we went to um, do a search of a trademark just so you can see the type of thing that you can find in here. And it's quite simple. So in the first box right here, you're going to select the field that you want to look up into. So most people want to look up uh, a trademark. So they'll just pick TM lookup. And that's kind of the broadest section to go look for a trademark in. And then let's say in your business, uh, maybe your trademark is, um, I don't know, let's just look up like Lululemon for whatever reason. And uh, I did this one time and I noticed uh, a new application filed for cosmetics. So sometimes you'll realize certain things about a company that they are ready to let you know, but the public actually hasn't been you know, completely informed yet. And don't forget, people will spy on your stuff in here too, right? So when you end up filing, make sure you're ready for the public to see what you're showing. So this is where the search has already returned all of these hits that include Lululemon. Uh, you can use some uh, different search tactics to have uh, more or less phonetic equivalents, all kinds of things like that. Uh, and this gives you the file application number, the actual trademark. And if it's a design, you'd see that on here as well, like this. Um, it categorizes the type. Is that a standard word mark, standard characters, is that a design? What is the status? Is it formalized, like meaning that it's been filed? Is it active or uh, inactive? In this case, this becomes interesting to me because we see that this mark was abandoned uh, under this section. And that means that it went through the examination process, but, uh, and then it was decided that they didn't want to continue. So you wonder, oh, that's interesting. I wonder why that might be. Not that we always have the answers, but in other cases, if it's abandoned under section 36, it indicates just an indication that it didn't make it through the examination stage. So why is that? And it may have nothing to do with examination, but it just gives us bits of information. And if we actually look into one of these files, let's look at this one, because it has a design. I feel like this one was drawn or something. It, it kind of it hasn't got the official look. Like there's some kind of indents here. I don't know, there's something a bit off. Doesn't look like a professional file drawing here. Um, Anyway, you can just start to see things. You get to see who is the company. These are the classifications of this drawing. That's under the Vienna Code, which is an agreement that we belong to. It also tells you their application number, the registration number. Obviously, this would not exist if it wasn't registered yet. That it's a design mark. That it's active right now. Um, that it's been registered. When will that registration expire? Wow. They've really renewed several times over already because that's a very long time from now. A trademark is usually registered for 10 years and can be renewed every 10 years, but these folks have clearly renewed it for 40 years at the beginning, which I'm not even sure if, you, if you're still able to do today. Um, so that's, that's interesting. Um, 
you get the name of the company and their address, the name of the agent that represents them. Uh, you get to view the documents that have been filed. So for instance, if there was an application filed or an examiner's report, nowadays under the TDRS system, you can actually go in and see all those documents in here. Examiner's correspondence, renewal, all of these documents. And you could go in and read what, what they actually corresponded to each other. Typically speaking, once an application um, is rep once an applicant is represented by a um, an agent, we don't discuss that file anymore at all because it's between the client and uh, and uh, and their representative, their uh, agent of record. It also uh, you can break it down to what was submitted to CPO, what was issued by CPO, and other documents. There's none. I've even seen the search reports in here uh, lately, not for all files, because we still haven't got, this is a system that's fairly recent, like to be able to see all the documents. So, um, yeah, I'm not able to reach my, go back here. And what else? Um, yeah, it just tells you kind of the process that file went through. So it was filed in June of 2000 was formalized, they had a change of agent on file, the search was done and recorded, the examiner wrote a report, then the client requested an extension of time, the file was approved, then it was advertised in the Trademark Journal, volume 49, 2504, and that's a process where the public has the opportunity to say, we're not in agreement with CBO and what they're doing, so we're gonna file an opposition to letting that go. And in whatever the in this case it was over, there was no opposition and it was allowed and then became registered. There was amendments made to registration. It was renewed, and uh, another agent changed. And so you just get to see all kinds of information about that file that might not otherwise uh, been able or easy for you to find. Um. In terms of those uh, sheets that I talked about, let's see if we can go to a different one, copyright, let's say. This is all about copyright so because we've gone in under copyright. But if I went in under the IP Academy or some of the resources we have, you wouldn't find it by product line, you'd find it for all products in one spot. So again, there's a guide to how does copyrights work? How do I prepare my application? And these are the different sections you would use once you're filing. Elizabeth, I'm so sorry to interrupt. It looks like we have a question from, from the audience. Yeah. Um, 30 count counseling, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask. Thanks. Um, on that Lululemon um, instance you were looking at, that was the, is that just the logo in this instance? That's what's being um, um, protected? Or, it would have been everything that we saw on that application. I believe it was words and design. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, and this might be, you know, something that you, you you talk about that you could help us with in, in step one, but I'll, I'll kind of ask it now. Like, what, what would happen if Lululemon, let's say, didn't register it? I, I see that you can. I appreciate the audit tracking and, and that you can see every step with transparency, but like, um, there's an alternate universe where they didn't register that content. What what happens? Other people come after and, and reproduce and, and steal that intellectual property essentially without the protection? Yeah, so yes, pretty much yes. Um, although you do not have to register a trademark. It's just that you're trying to protect the value. So if you were Lululemon, and you had not protected your thing, for instance, um, you know, what would be the value? Because people would just do knockoffs and uh, you'd be lost in the sea. So what they want by having protection is to show the consumer, look at, you can count on our product, you can trust us, we're, we're on it, we produce a quality product. Uh, um, and so often, let's say, because you don't have to register a trademark, it works really well in some cases. So if you're like where I live, my mechanic, my auto mechanic is Herb White. 
And so why would Herb White need to have a big old trade park, right? Because the only people that go there are the people that live close by. But if Herb all of a sudden one day created a new tool or a dye product to, you know, uh, make the brakes last longer and he needed to file maybe a patent or something, then it would make sense for him to, to go into having some kind of an IP conversation. So, um, and in terms of Lululemon, they actually did, um, well, they've had many instances of issues where intellectual property was very helpful for them to have had. But there was an example where another company uh, produced, uh, I think it was Calvin Klein, produced a pant that was very similar to the flap at the front of their yoga pants. And um, in uh, Lululemon was successful because uh, in that suit because they had filed an industrial design for that element. And so that was able to work in their favor and uh, and they won that little battle. So I, I hope I've answered the question. In some cases, you, you end up deciding to do what's right for your business based on what you know and the people around you are saying is sufficient. At another point, if you're going to be like a well-known brand, you'd be really in big trouble if you did not protect your IP. So I'm... And like a, a lot of the, the 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 items that you comment on seem to be a lot of, um, you know, like you said, industrial or the process of actually making a product. I can't speak for the other folks that are attending the call in the workshop, but like clarity counseling service is more of a service based uh, uh, industry that it's our it's our time, um, you know, something as simple as our logo. Um, and, and we've, we've noticed that some competitors have like lifted text verbatim from our website and are using it on there. So we say, ah, shoot, like, um, you know, our recourse for that is to say, Hey, that's ours. Um, and, but if we, you know, how, how do we prevent that from happening? Or is that, is that not what we're talking about today? It's pretty much what we're talking about. Okay. So when you become aware of intellectual property, then you're able to do certain things to position yourself to better protect that intellectual property. And it's like a, a varying scale. And that's who the experts around you will help you decide where you should sit yourself. Um, but for instance, uh, if you use copyright to protect some written material, you're allowed to do that for free. The problem is, is that so can somebody else, right? So um, another thing I could say is that with um, copyright or branding, once you have a registration, it does sit you in a very good position. So if somebody infringes, then you can take your certificate of registration from SIPO and you can say, listen, I registered this with SIPO. It is my prima facie evidence of ownership and I feel that you're infringing on my rights. So I'd like you to stop. And, um, you know, they have, uh, they have at that point been warned that you notice they're out there. Um, but you have to sometimes be careful too, because are you sure that they didn't do it first? Because I've seen many cases where you're absolutely certain somebody stole from you and then lo and behold, in the end, evidence comes through to show they actually did that two years ago. Because we're all very similar. We, um, we think of things, you know, <laughs> that other people have thought of. Mm -hmm. Another thing about owning a, a, an IP is on, on the other end. So let's say somebody says you're infringing what uh, was theirs. If you have filed for a registration, for example, with a trademark, then you just reply, no, see, I have my certificate of registration, so I deny that I am infringing. And what it does, it shifts the onus back to the other party. And that's kind of a good uh, position to be in because then they have to explain how is it infringing. And that can only happen under a certain section of the act, has to be one of five things. And once they've done that, and that takes some work and some effort to do, uh, again, you could simply say, no, you know what, here's my certificate of registration and I deny all those five things too. And again, it shifts the burden back. So, um, but these are really good conversations and questions to be having and thinking about because that's the whole point, right? How, how can you use this stuff smartly, whatever that means to you? If it means just being aware of it and ready, that's good. 
If it means filing for a protection and having copyright, that's good too. But those are decisions you're going to make with some level of information behind it. And that's what we hope for. Um, do we learn as we go and do we make mistakes? Yes. But uh, we learn a lot from our mistakes as well. And you'll probably learn from somebody else's mistakes being in this little group of, of uh, and you mentioned um, kind of like having a service business as opposed to a product. And I wanna tell you that intellectual property applies equally well. So uh, in terms of a trademark, it's the goods or services in association with, um, so that trademark in association with the goods and services. So for instance, um, uh, uh, how do I wanna say that quickly? Uh, a trademark is put on a product or in association with a service at the time it is transferred to the client. And that's, let's say, trademark use. So at the time that you're selling or talking about something with a client, uh, it's your in your case, it's your service, but you're still branding it under a certain um, mark or brand. And um, something I didn't mention, which is also very, very important, because when we only have a short amount of time, it's really difficult to cover all the important things, is that many countries have time limits involved. So like for industrial design or for patent that have to be novel at the time of filing, there are these exceptions. There's a, a period of grace that is allowed in some countries, and Canada and US have that. So if you've exposed the product, you can still have a year to then file, and we won't say it's not novel because you had that grace period. But the problem starts is that some countries don't have that. So for them, the minute it's exposed, it's exposed. So if you're gonna wanna cover your products in a certain country or your services, you need to know how do they deal with IP uh, before you expose things. You have to be very, very cautious about sharing uh, your information with other people. If I can summarize then, like the whole crux of this is we're protecting our business from a legal perspective. And all we're doing is ensuring that um, you know, we, we might have a trademark on any of our intellectual property, but it becomes more legitimized by registering it. And in the event that you encroach on someone else or someone encroaches on you, you're better positioned legally to, to respond to that challenge. Yeah. Uh, doesn't mean that you're not going to get challenged on it. Even if you're in the right, you still have lawyer fees, legal fees, et cetera. Um, that's, that's what we're, that's what we're, that's why IPO is important or, or intellectual property protection is important. Um, what about, um, so the, the three things that I'm concerned about are our website, our logo and published workshops and resources. Are those appropriate things to consider for, for trademark? I understand I have, we have one today because we're using it, but um, until it's registered, we're not as protected as we could be. Yes, they're all protectable by, I'm hearing maybe trademarks, copyright, maybe even industrial design in there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, there could be more, but just off the top of my head, those seem the most obvious to me. And, uh, and you're exactly right with your earlier comment too. We're just um, doing the best that we can to protect the value of your business because it's mostly going to be IP. So that's why we have to think about it ahead of time. And, uh, and luckily, um, we're surrounded by a lot of people in that profession that what would take you forever to learn and understand, you don't have to do because somebody else has made that their profession. So when you get to a certain point, um, plan to spend some money to get uh, an opinion from somebody else who spends every day doing that. And it's a very valuable contribution to your business, right? Uh, intellectual property should be a part of every meeting, um, whether it's just informing your staff about it and why it's important to um, protecting certain things through trade secrets, to being sure to use the trademark uh, the way it's registered or consistently with the same colors, et cetera. Um, you know, just that people put uh, an emphasis on 
uh, learning what it is. Because uh, in the end, when you look at companies out there, just Google top trademarks in Canada and you'll see the value of what they're worth. It's absolutely crazy. The value now is, I think I seen a chart the other day, uh, if you went back 30 or 35 years, 85% of a business, its value came from the manufacturing plant, the products and storage, uh, the machinery, whatever. Today, it's completely changed. 85% is all your intangible intellectual property assets. Nobody's holding stock anymore. They don't even have a warehouse half the time. So it's very much about intellectual property. I was at a franchise show and I actually had people wonder what I was doing there. And uh, it's just shocking to me. Like, wh what am I doing here? You're here to buy these large franchises. You're going to pay $300,000 to, to uh, do it their way and use their logo and pay them royalties. And, and you're wondering why I'm here, right? So, yeah. Thank you. That answers all my personal questions, so I'll make sure other people get time to. Right. Amazing. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth and Cody. I think um some of us had the same questions, so it was really great to kind of get some clarity around that. I think a lot of us were kind of wondering the same thing there. Um, did anybody else have any other questions? Feel free to unmute yourselves, type it out in the chat. Okay, I think, I think we're good. Uh, so a link to this uh, recording. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Uh, I draw all my own logos and do my own artwork for everything, even my website. All the images I use have been hand-drawn. So I'm wondering, is it important for me to protect, protect my own artwork and trademarks? Or is it safe because I've hand-drawn them all and they've all come from my own creativity? <laughs> Um, are you saying that you hand drew your logos? Yeah. So everything that is used as an image that I have as an image for my business, I have made myself. It's either a painting or a digital hand-drawn design that I've digitally rendered. Yeah. I don't think the manner in which it is created is as important as the protection of it. So um, I'm hearing that you've got several drawings and so that would maybe be several logos but I'm wondering if there is one particular brand that you use uh, for all of that or do you have several brands and you'd want to protect the brands so, so whether it was not one brand I've just started up gaining enough inventory to actually start selling out working out pieces so now I'm just worried about protecting, I guess, my own outlook to make sure that no one... Yeah, so true. maybe those need a copyright. Okay, so right? it is... So you could copyright a collection of art in, in one whole collection. So if you've got 12 pieces of art, you could do a copyright application for all 12 items. Or if it was a novel, you could do, you know, for so many novels, or so many poems, or you can do one at a time. And... Um, and uh, what was I going to say after that? Yeah, and then your your you yourself may have a brand. Like you might have, you know, I don't know, like Susie Designs as your yeah, so brand I, I brand. Have name and logo, and I've got my business number now under the name and logo. So I pretty sure it's okay because I hand drew it, and it's a. Um, I'm just wondering too because. I'm Indigenous, and a lot of what I do also incorporates a lot of cultural um, imagery. And I'm wondering at what point, uh, if cause I don't know if it's appropriate at all times to have like regalia and stuff like that up. So I, I, do I go to someone else for who would I um, go to? to what is there's a lot of things you said there. Uh, what I would say, it sounds to me like you have maybe gotten some information that makes you lean towards that if it was uh, an original creation, that you automatically have a copyright on it. And that would be true. 
but it's yeah. still advantageous perhaps to indicate that there's a copyright on it with your year, the date, uh, your name, and the C in a circle. Um, having said that, um, there is a lot of work going on in the indigenous people's world right now in terms of um, traditional knowledge and, and cultural exchange and stuff. So more to come on that. But there are um, various other pieces of what we do have in our current acts and regulations for the different IPs to do the protection, such as copyrights. Uh, sometimes it would be branding. Other times uh, it might be under like certification marks. So we know that there's the Anakshak with the igloo uh, and that's a brand that's a certification mark certifying that that art came from that particular territory for sure. And so that kind of weeds out people that are trying to um, imitate uh, that a certain product came from a place that it might not have come from. The other thing I would say, it's always important for you to probably check with your, uh, you know, elders and who who uh, may or may not have uh, particular things to share with you about your art. And uh, I would always, like you mentioned, insignia. That's why I'm suggesting it's always a good idea to check and make sure that this is not a problem for somebody and that it's it seems legitimate. I think that's a safe route to go, but you'd probably be the best guess or judge of that. So I'm thinking that you are indicating a lot about copyright. So the individual drawing of art or craft that you've done uh, is protected automatically. Um, it's just that there is an advantage in terms of reward or damage later if you actually put it out to the world that you thought you owned it. Um, and then the last thing is I, I'd still say there's probably a brand name in here for all of the things that you produce under your particular style or um, uh, image, I guess. Like if we think of like Van Gogh, okay? Like there's a certain image that comes with that art. So they've <laughs> got that, you know, brand that each individual art is something else on its own. Okay. Thank you. Uh, most of my questions were answered there. Thank you. You're welcome. Amazing. Do we have any other questions? All right, I think we're good. Uh, so just a reminder that a link to this recording will be available after this call. Um, I'd like to thank Elizabeth and the Canadian Intellectual Property Office for co-hosting with us today and sharing their expertise. Um, I will be definitely checking out some of those podcast episodes. They looked really interesting as well. Um, yes, so this was our last webinar in the Investor Ready Program for 2023. Um, so it's definitely worthy of a celebration before the holidays. Uh, so just a reminder, next Thursday, November 23rd at Full Beard Brewing here in Timmins, uh, it is free to register. We will have live music from Paul Sabalge, catering from Fusion Grill. I will be there. Al will be there. Uh, we are the mascots of the Investor Ready program at this point. Um, this is a great opportunity to let loose, network, um, eat some great food, uh, listen to some live music. So we hope to see and meet all of you there in person next week. Um, and have a great day, everyone. Thank you, Merci Thank and you very much. Thank you for having us. Bye. Yep. Thanks. Bye-bye.